Okay, so thanks. Thank you all for having me. Um, I should say that this talk today is not a modeling talk per se, but I'm hoping to illustrate some challenges in modeling um, based on a couple uh, observations from our work in our lab. And what I think about, yes, is very, very small particles over short time scales. And I'm really a fluid mechanics person interested in small things. Uh, but I'll give a little bit of background. So we're interested in plastic pollution, and we know plastic is everywhere in the environment. It's found in the open ocean, the deep sea, sea ice, sediments, atmosphere, a remote mountain lake in Mongolia. Uh, everywhere you look, we find uh, plastic. It's in humans and our beer. Um, and one way to characterize this is that plastic is a poorly reversible pollutant. It gets out into the environment, and it uh, breaks up into smaller and smaller pieces, which lets it disperse and um, which lets it, dis it disperse widely throughout the environment. And it degrades extremely slowly, so it accumulates in the environment. And we know, uh, we know that plastic is accumulating in the environment in lots of places, and there's a lot of work done on how it affects the environment and ecosystems and biology. That's a very active area of research. Um, but what I'm really more interested in is what its fate and transport is once it's in the environment. Uh, and okay, so what I think about a lot are plastic in the ocean and in uh, aquatic environments. And most plastics that we find out in the in the environment are considered what we consider microplastics. So these are small particles from micro to milla scale, but people also consider larger plastic pieces and their shape and density vary a lot depending on their source material. So they're very, um, they're very varied in their characteristics. And what's really interesting about plastic compared to other environmental particles that we study is that they're, they kind of fall outside, um, they're quite different. So I'm sure many people in this room think a lot about sediment, which we know is very heavy relative to water. Um, there's also a lot of work on bubbles, which are very light relative to water. But microplastics are interesting, the fact that they're very close to neutral buoyancy in water. And so a lot of the assumptions we make for these really high and low density particles, we can't always make the same way um, or not necessarily, which is uh, what I think about. And plastic, while it's close to neutrally buoyant, it can be both positively and negatively buoyant. Okay, and what I really think about is not just plastic particles, but particles in general and how the characteristics of the particles affect their transport. And I think about what happens when we consider the fact that particles do not just go with the flow, but they have either some inertia relative to the flow, they are buoyant or settling, so they're crossing streamlines, or because these, um, because they're finite particles, they don't have to be uniformly mixed, so they can preferentially sample parts of the flow too. So I think about how um, these manifest in flows like waves and turbulence that we find in the environment. And so why is this important? Maybe these are all really small effects that you can often neglect. So if, we, you're, if you have your small particle and you wanna know where it goes in a flow, uh, you can, your easiest assumption is just assume it goes with the flow, right? And you get some answer. But even if there are small deviations instantaneously, cause there's lift or drag on these small particles, if you're interested in transport, those small deviations can add up. So that's what I think about when that's important. Uh, okay, so if we're thinking about plastic, most of the work that's been done so far is really thinking about plastic transport in the ocean. And this comes from this really awesome review paper on the physical oceanography of plastic. What I just wanted to illustrate here is that there's tons of scales of, uh, and tons of processes we have to think about if we want to know where plastic goes, where it accumulates um, in the ocean, at least. So how it is transported from rivers to the ocean, how it washes up and is eroded from shorelines. It can move from that at the ocean to the atmosphere and back again out. And the processes out in the deep ocean are very different than the coastal processes, et cetera. So there's a lot to think about. Um, and I think about a couple of these different processes, but what I'm gonna talk to you today is just one. And we're gonna talk about the vertical distribution of microplastics. So imagine we're at the surface of the ocean or um, another body of water, and we have some buoyant particles collecting near the surface. So why might we care about this? So if we take measurements at the surface, we want most measurements are taken at the surface. So we need to know their vertical distribution to extrapolate. Light decays with 
depth and plastic does photodegrade with light. So their vertical distribution controls their fate and it also controls their transport. Many environmental flows we know are sheared. Um, this is from a study at the surface of the ocean where they measured the velocity. Oh, I can use the pointer, right? Um, where they measure, measure the horizontal velocity as a function of depth, and this is a log scale. So what you can see is just going up and down a couple centimeters here um, changes your horizontal velocity a ton. So just moving up and down a little bit in the water column, right, can totally change your transport. And what we're going to think about is what happens in a really idealized scenario where wind blows on the free surface, it generates turbulence and mixing, but these particles are buoyant and they want to rise. Many of you may think, uh, notice that this is maybe similar to sediment in a bottom boundary layer where you have shear from the bottom boundary layer generating turbulence, which can suspend heavy particles, which can then settle back down. And there's a lot we can learn from sediment transport, but there's also some key differences, which is what I think about. But right, right now, what we're going to start by doing is taking a really idealized look and assuming we're in equilibrium, where the mixing from turbulence is in equilibrium with the rate at which particles are rising due to buoyancy. We're going to make some assume that the particles rise with some constant rise velocity and that there's some constant mixing we can parameterize with some diffusivity. If we do that, we get this really nice result where our concentration of our plastic particles will decay with depth exponentially with our concentration peak at the free surface. So this makes sense. This is, you know, um, more buoyant particles will if they have a higher rise velocity, they'll be closer to the surface. If there's more mixing, they'll be mixed lower down. And even with this really simple model, there are still three important parameters we need. We need to know something about the surface boundary condition, which is now different than if we're thinking about a bottom boundary layer of sediment. We have processes like wave breaking, there's surface tension we need to think about, there's wind, um, and we need to know the local concentration. We need to know something about the mixing, so we need to um, we're not going to really talk about that in this talk, but it's not necessarily obvious what this diffusivity is all, always. We need to know the rise velocity. And for small particles, we can, you know, take their Stokes rise, Stokes rising velocity. Um, but that's not necessarily what the particles are actually rising with in an unsteady flow. And so that's another thing we think about. And in waves, which are strong at the um, ocean surface, we showed some work that waves can actually enhance the rise velocity of particles. But we know that turbulence can also reduce, or other work by others has shown that turbulence can reduce the rise velocity. So that's also not an obvious parameter. And so that's something else that we think about. But not that's also beyond the scope of this talk. OK, so let's get to some observations. So I'm going to show you some work of microplastics collected from the field. Because we have that model, and it's, um, but it, we want to see how well it works. And so this is from measurements taken, um, not by me, but by my collaborators at SEA, where they can take measurements of microplastics at different depths over the ocean. Okay, and so what does this look like? So here we have concentration over depth. And so this, these black dots here are by number density. So the number of microplastics per volume goes down with depth. That's what we expect. But this other line here is mass density and it's going down, but it's going down uh, more rapidly with depth, which means that there are not only fewer particles at depth, but they're smaller. Okay, so we can take that away. Um, then we can also look at the type of particles because these particles are very varied. Some of them are these um, like long filamentous fibers and some are more flat fragments. So we can divide the concentration profile by these lines, these fibers and by the fragments. And we see that we get different behavior depending on the type of particle where the lines are more well mixed with depth and the fragments decay with depth. Uh, okay, so, but we want to do something a little bit more than this. So what we can do is we can think about what we expect to be important, right? Buoyancy and turbulence, and we can construct a non-dimensional number. This is really just um, very similar to a Rouse number, but now these are positively buoyant particles. And so this, um, what do, we, we can think about the limits of this parameter. So when this Rouse number is really small, we expect the particles to be well mixed. When it's when it's close to unity, we expect maybe some partially mixed profile. And when it's much, much greater than one, all the particles should be trapped at the surface. Um, so this makes sense, but it hasn't 
really fully been tested. So what was really cool about this data set is not only did we collect microplastics over depth, but we measured the rise velocity of each individual particle, because that's what we need. Because remember, these microplastics are really varied, and they can't all be modeled necessarily the same way. Uh, so what we can do is we can estimate the mixing, and we can now segregate our concentration profiles as a function of this RAS number. So this, I've just plotted the total concentration again for reference. If we look at the really low Rouse number, we get, we see that we do see this well-mixed profile, which was great to see. If we look at the more intermediate Rouse number, then we see this partially mixed that does follow this exponential decay with depth rather um, okay. And if we look at the really high Rouse number, we see that the particles are surface trapped. So this was great to see this um, in observations in the field. And it shows that there's a lot we can learn right from sediment models and that these um, from sediment transport and that this kind of formulation works pretty well. Uh, okay, so just to kind of go over what we did in the field was that this um, did confirm that this Rouse number scaling can apply to a free service boundary layer as well, rather than just a bottom boundary layer. And we observe these different regimes. But what's also really nice is you don't always know the rise velocity or the you know, all it's very time consuming to take all these measurements of all the individual particles. So what we also saw is that just sorting by particle type is also really helpful in getting at the concentration. Okay, but we haven't said anything about transport yet, and that's what I'm really interested in. So what I really am is an experimentalist in the lab. So now I'm going to show you some uh, laboratory work, which is where we can blow wind over a free surface so we can kind of generate similar conditions that we see in the ocean in the lab. So we're gonna get some turbulence, there'll be waves. And this is work done by a postdoc in my group. So we have this facility at Washington, which is great. And all we can do is we can generate um, a flow and put some particles in and then track them. And so what I'm showing you here is observation. So the pop is kind of like a, an okay reconstruction of the free surface that we now have a better version of um, during the experiment. And here are our particle trajectories and they're colored by speed. So the darker ones are uh, when they're going faster. So what's going on here is the particles are positively buoyant. They're mostly near the free surface and they have these wave orbital motions you get under waves. But every once in a while, there's a bunch of particles um, being mixed deeper. And that's because there's this intermittent wave breaking, which is generating a lot of turbulence, which is what we often get when you have, um, you get kind of intermittent breaking and mixing. So you see particles get mixed down and then they get mixed up. And we can do these types of experiments and we can vary the particles and the waves and test um, different models and measure things like transport now, because we, um, we have their velocity. Okay. So what we're gonna look at here, what we're looking at here is just the equilibrium concentration of three particles under the same conditions. And so here is their kind of Rouse number. We have a low Rouse number and a higher Rouse number and a medium Rouse number scenario, small, medium, large particles. And we get again, results we might expect. So we see that the smallest particles, the concentration profile is rather well mixed. Those are the small dots and the largest ones do show this kind of exponential decay. We have this funny, um, these funny points of this free surface because we have a wave. So you can't measure, um, you know, the, the measurement of where you start is um, a little distorted. So that uh, this dashed line kind of ma marks the lowest wave trough. Okay, so we see the concentration kind of makes sense, but what about transport? So what we can also do is we can measure their average um, horizontal velocity. And in this flow, the velocity is sheared, so things move faster at the surface than at the at depth. And what we see is that all of the particles, no matter their um, their location, their depth at the bottom, all seem to follow this same um, kind of fluid, or they're moving with the fluid pretty well. This is pretty well tracks the fluid. But at the surface, we see that the larger particles are actually moving faster than the smallest particles. And this um, what I said earlier in the talk is that just the, the, your vertical position should control to the most part, your horizontal transport, right? But what we're seeing here is that at the same vertical location, there is different horizontal transport depending on the type of particle. And so why is this happening? Well, let's look a little closer first. So we can normalize 
the this area by the, the smallest particles. And what we see is that the largest particles can move on average up to 40% faster than the smallest particles at the same depth. That um, was confusing to us and we uh, weren't exactly sure where this was coming from. But we, uh, so first we thought maybe it could be due to the fact that these particles are inertial, they're large, they have different dynamics. But we went through and worked that out, which I'm not going to go through and show that that's only a really small effect, about 1%. Um, but instead, what we think is happening is that these larger particles are more buoyant and they're more concentrated near the free surface. So I said that the wave breaking is occurring at the free surface, which is coupled to, um, and these larger particles are probably only being entrained by the wave breaking events. And we, um, there's been other work that has shown that wave breaking increases horizontal transport. So if you're the same part in a wave that's not breaking versus the breaking part, um, you're going to go, you're going to have a stronger horizontal transport under the breaking part than the non-breaking part. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, so what we're saying is that the buoyant particles can preferentially sample wave breaking in a way that enhances their overall transport. So what I was trying to illustrate with this is that just knowing sometimes the vertical concentration is not enough in some flows because there can be this preferential sampling effect where some particles spend more time in faster moving parts of the flow than others, which is complicated and hard. Um, to, so what we're working on is trying to kind of formalize, formalize this, take more observations so that we can get it in a way that can be used in a model. So to uh, summarize, microplastics are this new type of environmental relatively new type of environmental particle that fall outside the regimes of other environmental particles. The, part of the, the properties of the particles will dictate their behavior. And while there's a lot of similarity between microplastics at a free surface and sediment at a bottom boundary layer, there is definitely some differences that we need to think about as we apply these models, like breaking waves, near neutral buoyancy, and that these particles are also in really low concentrations. Um, with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. So we have time for one question, which I see here in the front. HDPE stand for? That's the oh, that's the high density polyethylene. That's the type of plastic. Yeah. So that was nine hundred and seventy kilograms per meter. Yeah, in freshwater. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so the density difference to seawater is going to be like seventy kilograms per meter cubed. Yeah. Do, do people look at the acoustic impedance contrasts? They're very hard. Uh, I've talked with people about measuring them acoustically, and they're yeah. very, it's, it seems like the density difference is small. Is You could do yeah. thermo, thermo haline structure. Yeah. The density difference is smaller than that. Like, yeah, but just, they're also that they're very low concentrations. Like they're okay. very low, like there's, right. yeah. there's a lot of plastic, but it's typically because the ocean is very large. There's a lot but it's a very low concentration. Very low concentration. That <laughs> like, yeah, locally, yeah. So can you not know, like do a comparison between, I can't remember what it's called, like the very shallow acoustic sampling and the dredging stuff that you do? So um, I'm not an expert in acoustics, but I have talked with people and it seems not trivial is what I, but definitely, people are definitely interested. That was a great talk. Thank you. Mm -hmm.